Art Aluminum Society's patron is Blessed John Henry Newman. I'm sure most of you are familiar with him. He greatly influenced the Catholic Church and the world uh, on the idea of a university. Uh, but much of his writing has been uh, misinterpreted, I think grossly, as being unconcerned with students' life outside the classroom, uh, including the liturgical life. Uh, at the university that, that uh, Blessed Newman struggled to establish in Ireland, the university church was deliberately built at the very center of the campus, and the church frequently offered sacraments and the liturgies of the church. And Newman thought it particularly important that students would be drawn to university sermons by, quote, good preachers. Uh, the students lived in small communities called houses, uh, much like Oxford University, and a rector encouraged both moral and intellectual development and encouraged daily mass attendance by the students. Uh, today, however, it's the rare student at most Catholic colleges and universities who starts his or her day with mass, or even his or her week. Nevertheless, there are several Catholic colleges, as we've, as we've talked about, in the United States that have placed great priority in providing authentic and beautiful liturgies on campus. Uh, and we've already talked a little bit about this, but I think that these institutions demonstrate <coughs> that even in today's highly secular society, it's still possible today to make sacred liturgy as central to campus life as Blessed Newman would have wanted. Uh, so my question to the panel, to the extent that you have had experience in these faithfully Catholic colleges, uh, would you be willing to talk about what you've seen, how these institutions help the students to experience good liturgy, and what sort of impact this has on the students uh, and also on the institution in terms of campus life and the institution's capital. Um, uh, John Henry Newman is one of my heroes, and, and, and uh, um, I must say that his experience in Ireland, especially with the bishops, was an absolute failure. That they had no interest in. <coughs> in Cardinal Newman's understanding either either of a university in the intellectual sense nor 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 in his vision of of uh, uh, the religious uh, sense. So so um, uh, I think that that's probably still the case uh, uh, because of a spirit of, of uh, anti uh, anti-intellectualism among the hierarchy uh, that has been there for a long time in this country. And, and there doesn't seem to be an interest there um, and an understanding of the intimate link between the intellect and uh, faith. So, so uh, I think like a <coughs> woman who in the crisis, of course, the Anglican Church um, uh, said the Pusey, Pusey never depend on the bishops. <laughs> <laughs> I would obviously second that regarding uh, Blessed John Henry Newman. Regarding the charge that he was simply too cerebral when he understood his own life, it just seems impossible to me that a man who fell in love with St. Philip Neri and, be, and founded the oratory in England would be lopsided uh, intellectually. That you know, the very oratorian essence is is an engagement uh, in liturgy and in confession and in preaching. Um, I can definitely say that the the presence of uh, the right celebrant on campus or at a student center can make a big difference. Uh, one of the interesting things that I've observed at Baylor. Uh, there have been three Catholic priests in the 10 years that I've been there that have served the needs of the student center. The previous chaplain uh, had a big personality. He was this charismatic Nigerian priest. And the students loved him, and he had rather dynamic liturgies. And uh, attendance was good. Our most recent uh, chaplain is a Chinese-American, and he's very quiet and shy and attendance has skyrocketed. <laughs> <laughs> and it's nothing against the previous chaplain. I, I wondered why was that? I couldn't figure, figure it out, but 
there's a way in which uh, our current chaplain, uh, Father Lou, is just an authentically humble man. And it's very clear that when he celebrates in either form, he completely divests himself of his own ego and his own personality. He's not there to perform. He's simply a simple servant of the rubrics. And it is, and he's not a taskmaster. He didn't berate the choir and tell them to stop being so whatever. But I think just through his quiet example, he changed the culture of the student center, he changed the tone of the liturgies. And even the students now, the, the tone they have, the, the atmosphere of reverence they have is different. It's been a remarkable thing to observe. You, you surprised me. That was wonderful, the, the, the way you delivered. You know. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you said it, attendance has, I thought you were going to say No, I second everything you just said, and rather than repeat it, um, <coughs> for what it's worth, my, my experience, I graduated from Thomas Aquinas <gasps> College, um, and I have a lot of friends at Christendom College, and so what I'm about to say, it actually would apply to many of the sister schools of Wyoming Catholic College. I think it's very important also to create what I would call support structures for the liturgical life. So for example, um, the extraordinary form is not self-evident to people. It might be self-evidently mysterious or even beautiful, but there's such a depth of participation for which students need to be formed. This is part of what we all talk about how Vatican II said, if you don't have liturgical formation, you might as well give up hope for anything else because you, the mass cannot explain itself. It, it, that needs to be done outside the mass. Um, and so I think we, one thing I've seen really effective is having, uh, we have what we call spirituality practica, practic <laughs> practicum courses um, offered either by chaplains or by theology professors. Uh, we've done them on Lexio Divina, we've done, we did a practicum on the liturgy itself. Um, we went through the whole Usus Antiquior, the Mass of the Catechumens, the Mass of the Faithful. We talked about the, whole, the history of the prayers. Um, and basically just helped them at a very basic level to um, how do you use a missile with the extraordinary form, right? Um, what are the proper of the Mass? Uh, why do we say some, some prayers on some days and not on other days? Uh, just, you know, the calendar, how it all works, it, it's something that, that we can take for granted, but you can't take anything for granted anymore, it seems to me. So that kind of practicum, I think, is important. It's an optional thing once a week for an hour, but we have good attendance at these practica, and I think that really helps the students enter into the liturgy. Um, uh, another thing is um, choir and scola. I can't emphasize the importance of getting young people to sing. Uh, if it were up to me, I would have required mandatory choir for all students. Um, that's what St. John's College does uh, to this day. I think it's a marvelous thing. All the freshmen have to sing in the choir. Um, he, fortunately, at Wyoming Catholic, we have about 120 students now, and 40 <coughs> students were in the choir last year. So I had something, something you know, it wasn't required for everyone, but still one third of the students elected to do it. And uh, in the choir, just singing the chant over and over again, singing polyphony, good hymns in four parts, um, that, that there's just a way that that draws the soul. It, draw, it draws you into the Mass um, or into the Liturgy of the Hours much more deeply than just always reciting things or even, even just having silence as important as that is. Um, music kind of charms the soul. Um, that's why it's so important. Another thing that, that's developed um, as a student initiative is, uh, this is, a, I guess, taking a cue from maybe from Steubenville, but our, our young men and women have created brotherhoods and sisterhoods on campus. So they have groups of six or seven um, men or women, and they meet weekly to just talk about how things are going with their studies, with their spiritual life, uh, whatever it might be. And the priests, the chaplains, uh, will often meet with them as well. So uh, you know, they, they schedule various things that they do with one another. This is, these are just some examples of the kinds of thinking that has to go on outside of what happens in the sanctuary, outside of what happens in the chapel, to make that's more accessible and more um, efficacious. Kind of a little bit in tandem with what Dr. Kuznicki was saying. Um, an observation. I think that there are a lot of university uh, chaplaincies in which campus ministry is kind of envisioned in a way, and maybe it's more kind of just my own local context, but more of kind of like a, a souped up Protestant youth group kind of concept of ministry, you know, which is fine as far as it goes. I mean, you know, if you want to go on a service trip or a ski trip and do some Bible studies, I mean, 
There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Uh, but I think that we should never be afraid of the rich intellectual and sacramental tradition of the faith. Um, one of the things that I found so often in working with uh, college students is because you know there's so many crises that that uh, young adults go through during that time. Uh, the sacrament of confession, uh, making that an authentic encounter with the mercy of God, uh, the uh, spiritual uh, teaching, I mean, in, exposing them to the spiritual classics of the church, and then uh, getting them to really uh, drink very profoundly from the liturgy. We, we call it the source and summit of the Christian life for a reason, uh, and uh, particularly at that time period, uh, you know, going into depth with the intellectual and uh, liturgical tradition of the church uh, can give them not only stability during that time, uh, but also help them to live the life of grace uh, and also get other people involved as well. Um, you know, and, and parishes are also important. Uh, if, if parishes are uh, places which uh, direct children towards uh, good Catholic universities or places with strong campus ministries, uh, and also also, the children grow up in Catholic schools or, or religious education programs with a vivid sense of the sacred, they will seek those things out. Um, you know, in my own parish, where we have both forms of the Roman Rite every day, uh, a lot of times, you know, I'll be talking to the youth group and you have seniors who are waiting to go off to college, and they come to me and say, Father, where am I going to go to Mass? Uh, that's one of their first questions, or they base their decision to go to college on a place where they know that they can have access to the extraordinary form, or where they could sing in a scola. Uh, so I think that even before they get to you know, the first day, you know, orientation of college, uh, that the parishes already uh, can do a tremendous amount, uh, and then uh, university chaplaincies don't be afraid of those really important uh, questions in doing that. Um, about 15 years ago, a friend of mine said uh, to me, and this is in connection with another school, um, if we don't start Eucharistic adoration here, then most of what we do is not going to bear much fruit. Um, and so she got perpetual adoration going at that school. We have, we have not been able to do perpetual adoration yet, um, but we have adoration every day uh, from about 1 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Uh, and I just, I, I can't, I can't begin to tell you how much of a blessing that's been. So, to the extent, I mean, to the extent to which adoration can be placed in along with confessions, we have confessions going at the same time, uh, part of that time. Um, that seems to me one of those encounters that is outside of the mass and yet intimately connected to it. 